Hi, today we're having another look at this LED driver. First of all, I made a slight modification here and I fitted a slightly different MOSFET which suits the layout of the pads a little bit better and therefore we should get better heat sinking from the MOSFET into the PCB. So this is the new MOSFET that I've fitted and you can see it's got the pad layout which suits a little bit better what's on the PCB. So the drain all on one side here which allows us to rotate it with the gate on the right hand side and then the source on the left. So that fits a lot better without having to flip anything upside down or use some wires to connect it. So with all of the heat or the majority of the heat coming out of the drain pins we've got that going straight onto one of the pads on the PCB. So this MOSFET is more than capable for what we need it for in this application. You can see we've got a continuous drain current of about 7.2 amps. We shouldn't need more than 2.4 amps and more importantly it's still got quite a low gate charge. So about minus 4.5 volts VGS uh, we're seeing about 11.8 nanocoulombs. The switch at IC does recommend less than 30 especially if you're driving at higher frequencies so this is absolutely fine. So what I wanted to address today, and a few of you mentioned it in the comments, is when we were driving the LED, you could actually hear a slight tone from the PCB, which we shouldn't actually be able to hear if this is all working properly, because the RC combination that we've got here in the controlled off time pin should result in a switching frequency of 125 kilohertz. Now when I attach the signal generator to change the brightness, that was only at 250 hertz, so quite a lot lower than the tone that you were hearing. So um, I'm, I don't think the two frequencies were playing off against each other because as you change the frequency, you could still hear some random tones in there. But certainly today, what I want to have a look at is what the waveforms look like from this switch IC because I have not looked at those yet. So when I was designing this PCB, I did create this spreadsheet here for calculating the various component values on the board and verifying the operation. So you can see here we've got our nominal input voltage of 24 volts. Our output voltage um, I assumed was about 12 volts. It's actually slightly higher than that. We can have a look to see if that affects anything. But really the switching frequency that we're aiming for is affected by the capacitor and the resistor values into the controlled off time pin. And with the 470 picofarads and the 66k resistor we should get a switching frequency of 126 kilohertz so that's what we need to verify next. Okay so what we're going to be looking at is the input to the gate so pin 6 and we've got it set up on the picoscope and here is the waveform so um, oh actually we've got it at the bottom here sorry the text is very small but there we go with 100 with 24 volt input we've got a frequency of 126 kilohertz. So that is actually working at the design frequency. There's a little bit of jitteriness, so let's just zoom out and make sure that there's not some other waveform that we're seeing on top of that. But no, that all looks stable. So certainly with no PWM waveform going into it, that looks exactly how we would expect. So we're now driving the input with a PWM waveform at 4 kHz, which is particularly audible. However, I think we're just hearing the fundamental frequency here. I don't think there's any weird harmonics or strange behaviour going on with this switching controller. I think just literally this inductor is particularly noisy. Maybe because of the construction, maybe the windings aren't covered in glue or adhesive or something like that so there's a bit of resonation going on inside the device itself but everything seems to be behaving normally. Now if we zoom in at low duty cycles like this and relatively high frequencies you can actually see there's quite a large period of the on time that is taken up before it starts oscillating and that is the inductor uh, storing energy and then at this point this is where we'll see the ripple current in the inductor where the device starts switching and I'm wondering if maybe this is making it a little bit no more noisy than it could be because that 100 microhenry inductor is very large indeed perhaps we could scale it back we could tweak up the switching frequency and then scale back the size of the inductor and maybe that would reduce the noise but if we change the frequency particularly if we take it down to something like 200 or 100 hertz it's quite inoffensive so that's 100 hertz and it just sounds like sort of background noise going on really there's not a lot there 
and we could probably just get away with carefully selecting that PWM frequency so that it doesn't cause any annoyance. So even on a simple book regulator like this, a lot of the parameters are all interlinked very tightly. What we could do, for example, to reduce the size of our inductor is to increase the amount of ripple current in our inductor. So if we change that from 400 milliamps up to one amp, you can see that changes our inductor value from about 100 microhenries down to 42 microhenries. But what that means is on every switching cycle, our MOSFET is conducting more current to try and store more energy in that inductor. So our MOSFET current goes up. We could also increase the switching frequency. So if we change it to 500 kilohertz and then adjust our resistor value on the board to 16K, that will change our switching frequency actually to 520 kilohertz. But you can see now our, our inductor size has gone down to 10 microhenries. Now if we took that back to 0.4 amps on our inductor ripple current, you can see we're getting about 25 mi microhenries, which is a little bit more reasonable. We could stick a 22 microhenry inductor there and everything should behave. So there's quite a bit of tweaking we could do to try and make that tone less audible. What I'm going to try now is just changing the switching frequency because that's nice and easy to change and see what that does. So just to demonstrate this, I've adjusted the resistor value to 27 kilo ohms and that should give us a switching frequency of 308 kilohertz. If we have a look at the waveform now, you can see that is exactly what we're getting. So 308 kilohertz, but the switching frequency has not altered the tone that we're hearing. We're definitely hearing that PWM frequency. So we've changed the switching frequency from 125 kilohertz up to 300 kilohertz. What that means is now we could reduce the size of the inductor because the amount of time that this is supplying energy to the LED with the switch turned off is now reduced because we've changed that switching frequency and increased it. What it also means though is we've got slightly more switching losses in the MOSFET because we're having more switching cycles per second. Now one thing we can try is reducing the size of this inductor to see if it has any change on that audible tone that we can hear now. Now the only one that I've got in the same footprint is 68 microhenries. What that means is that 25 microseconds that we see where the inductor is storing energy when it first turns on might reduce to something like 17 microseconds with this 68 microhenry inductor. But this obviously is a different brand as well so it might be constructed differently and that may be enough to get rid of the tone. So to desolder this inductor, I'm going to give you a preview of an item which I've just been sent, which we'll do a proper review of. But this is a little miniware MHP30, and it's actually a miniature hot plate for heating up the PCB in a localized area so that when you're working with multi layer PCBs, particularly on mobile phones where you might have in excess of eight layers and lots and lots of copper it's quite difficult often to desolder components on there. So they've come up with this little hot plate. It is quite cute and it looks really well built. Um, so we're going to try and use this on this because it's almost like it was designed for this particular PCB because we can sit this underneath the inductor and we'll be able to desolder the inductor nice and easily and put the new one in place. So I think this says this goes all the way up to 300 degrees C. We used bismuth lead free solder on this PCB. So as long as we can get it up to about 175 degrees C, we won't actually need to provide any external heat. So let's give this a go and see what happens. So it seems to behave very similarly to the soldering irons in terms of the user interface. It should now be heating up as you can see. And indeed it is actually getting hot there. So let's see if it can get it up to temperatures to actually just allow us to remove this inductor without any extra heat. We well, might be able to see, so there is a little LED indicating how hot it is, so that's quite neat. Like I said, we'll have a proper look at this in another video, but this is almost the perfect application for me to try it out, so I did want to get it out and give it a go here. And I've just knocked everything on the board. Huh. 
So that little hot plate worked quite nicely actually, it's just a shame that uh, I was a little bit clumsy there and almost knocked half the components on the PCB. These tweezers wouldn't quite open wide enough to hold the inductor properly, so that's why I came a cropper. But let's give this a test now and see if anything has changed. So as anticipated, it has reduced that amount of time here for where the inductor is storing all the energy. So that has now reduced to 17 microseconds, which I think is what I said. Uh, prior to the component change. However, I can still hear that audible tone. It's not really made any difference to that. If I change it up to four kilohertz, in fact, it's marginally quieter, but not really anything to write home about. I think back at 100 hertz is pretty much the sweet spot. So I think what we can learn from this is that PWM dimming can be a little bit problematic with switching converters, particularly where you have quite large inductors and you're always going to hear some kind of tone when you've got your PWM frequency in the audible range and you're chopping up the switching waveform in order to achieve the dimming. Now what you could do is increase the PWM frequency up to 20 kilohertz but to prevent the switching frequency and our PWM frequency from beating against each other and causing some weird effects with the LED you then need to push the switching frequency up even higher and then you might suffer from inefficiencies in the MOSFET and the diode and that might cause other problems. Now the datasheet does describe another method where you put a MOSFET in parallel with the two components that set the switching frequency but overall the net effect is the same. It still chops up that waveform. The only true way to get rid of any kind of audible tone is to use analog dimming and there is one pin on this IC which has the output from the internal reference which is where the whole current is derived from. So we've got a sense resistor here and by tweaking that you're setting the voltage which it's trying to see across that resistor. And similar to the ring light project where um, I used an analog voltage to control the voltage into that pin, on this we could do exactly the same thing and instead of chopping up the waveform the control loop would be trying to control the current based on a new set point as you change the voltage up and down. But because I'm driving this from the ESP32, that really doesn't have a very good uh, output that we could use to drive that pin directly. So either we could use an external DAC, we could use a PWM output from the ESP32 and then filter it to create a waveform, or we could just stick with the PWM dimming and have it at a range which is not going to be quite so audible. So around 100 Hz seems to work quite nicely and doesn't really give any flicker on the LED. So I think I'm probably going to stick with it as it is and I may have to do that. You'll find out in the next couple of videos why that is the case. So I hope you found the video useful. Thank you to Miniware for sending in this little hot plate. We'll do a proper review on it at some point but it's actually quite nice. The only problem really that I'm seeing is that it's quite tall. So this PCB I had to support with my other hand which lost me a little bit of dexterity but I'll put a link to this I think they've got it on their AliExpress store so I'll put a link to this if you want to have a look at that. Uh, thank you to JLC PCB for providing these PCBs for this video and until next time thanks for watching. <laughs>